Um, I'm Melinda Kaufman. I'm the USDA SBIR program coordinator, and I'll just jump right in. Um, I want to first talk a little bit about the broad goals of SBIR, um, and those are to meet the federal research and development R&D needs by stimulating technological innovation. And we also want to increase private sector commercialization of innovation that are derived from federal R&D funding. And very importantly, we want to foster and encourage participation in innovation and entrepreneurship by women and socially and economically disadvantaged individuals. Some of the features of our USDA SBIR program include that the ideas are all investigator initiated um, and the awards are based on <laughs> technical merit, the PI and the company qualifications and the commercial potential of the innovation. So all those things kind of have to balance out. Um, and then we um, encourage subcontracting to universities and to USDA labs. And we'll talk more about that in a few minutes. And then um, success metrics, um, some of those from receiving SBIR grants include things like an increase in the number of jobs in the United States, uh, an increase in the sales of technologies and services and sale to other businesses of licenses to the technology developed. So, um, our, a little bit just about our uh, funding. We have an annual budget right now of around 29 million. And um, uh, for FY21, um, we had um, a phase one that was $100,000. This year, our um, award amounts are different. For most of the awards, it's $175,000. So that's a long awaited increase in our award size. For two of the awards, which is um, 8.6, which is rural and community development, and um, 8.12, which is small and mid-sized farms, it's 125,000. So it's 175,000 and 125,000. Phase two is 600,000, um, and it's a two-year grant. Phase one is an eight-month grant. However, it's very easy to get a no-cost extension if you need one. So just some um, you know, examples of um, the competitiveness of the awards is for phase one in FY19, we had a 14.8% award rate and in FY20, it was a 16.1% award rate. For phase two, um, that is not quite as competitive because only phase ones can apply for phase two. There's no straight to phase two. So, um, in FY19, we had a 40.6% success rate. And then in FY20, we had a 42.6 success rate. I also want to spend some time talking about technical and business assistance because it's not brand new, but it's relatively new. And we want to increase awareness about technical and business assistance. So it's called TABA or TABA, however you want to pronounce it. Um, and it was introduced as part of the John S. McCain National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2019. TABA can include things like, um, you know, exploration into marketing, um, market research, uh, financial review, um, and IP legal costs and things, activities related to manufacturing. And that's just a smattering of what it can include. Um, and um, you can individualize it um, to really meet your needs and kind of hone in on your needs. Um, so for phase one, it's $6,500 um, um, to, uh, in, that's above your award amount. So it doesn't come out of your budget. It's something that we pay for the USDA um, and it's in addition to your budget. And they help you develop a commercialization plan and, you know, really kind of get that in place for phase two. For phase two, it's $50,000. And that's um, to further move your project into commercialization. Um, a little bit about the SBIR topic areas. Um, we have 10 topic areas. And um, you know the, it encompasses a wide variety of um, agriculture. 
uh, agricultural topics. And so we have forest and related resources. We have two plant production and protection. One is 8.2, which is biology, and the other is 8.13, which is engineering. Then we have animal production and protection, conservation of natural resources, food science and nutrition, rural and community development, aquaculture, biofuels and bio-based fuels, and small and mid-sized farms. Now you might notice on the slide that um, both 8.6 and 8.12 are in red font, and that is there to remind me that to tell you that um, these two topic areas are uh, slightly different um, than the rest in that you don't have to have a completely new innovation. You can have an off the shelf innovation that um, is applied in a new novel way. So um, you can take something off the shelf and if you have an inventive idea about how to apply it, then uh, you might look into these topic areas. And we add this slide just to remind people, I imagine all of you know this, but we just still wanna remind people that agriculture is um, very much involved with science. It's in, if you have a scientific innovation, then you very well might have an agricultural application for that innovation. So we do everything, you know, from robotics and nanotechnology to acoustics, remote sensing, pre precision agriculture, um, you know, genetic engineering, we, you know, all of that. And this is just, um, you know, a small list of, of what agriculture is involved with. The, okay, so these are our timelines. This year, as I'm sure you all know, the timelines were off. It was held up, um, the R RFA was held up, um, up the chain of command. And so um, it was later this year, but these are our typical timelines and this is what we hope to get back to. I'll say for phase one that um, uh, we, um, the deadline for phase one, it's open now um, and the deadline is November 3rd. Um, but typically, this is more typical in um, 2021, we have it released in July or August, and the proposal deadline is in October, and panels held in January, and awards June for August. So this year, since we were late, and we didn't, it wasn't published until September 10th, then the proposal deadline again is November 3rd. And the panels will be held in January and February. They'll go through February, but then I think we'll have enough time to get back on a schedule and submit those awards June through August of 2022. So we'll just slowly kind of get back on track there. And then hopefully next year, it won't be, um, the RFA won't be held up again. And um, we're, we're gonna shoot to publish it in July. So, um, we hope to get back on track. And then for phase two, um, so again, I just wanna emphasize it's only open to phase one awardees. There's no straight to phase two option. And we're still shooting for the RFA to be released in December. Typically, the proposal deadline is February or March, but because some people who have you know, phase one and phase one was late, this year, the proposal deadline is probably going to be in April, probably early April, which doesn't give you the full eight months um, if you're, you know, um, to wind up your project. But it's it'll be close to seven months, and um, you know you don't have to have your phase one completed. So hopefully um, that will still work out. Uh, for those who want to apply that first year for phase two. Um, and so that proposal deadline, as I said, this year, it'll probably be April, early April. And then next year in 2023, we're going to try to get back on track with the phase all two also. So it'll go back to February, March. Panels will still probably be held in June or July. And then notifications will be sent out in August of 2022 and awards made in September of 2022. And so we'll do the same thing since phase one is gonna set back phase two a little bit this year. 
then we'll slowly kind of get back on track with that and get those awards out in September and notifications in August. So I really think we'll be able to do that. Um, so uh, now I'm going to talk a little bit about the review process. So you have a under, I want you to leave with some kind of understanding of that, the review process. The proposals are evaluated. It's a confidential peer review panel. It's outside experts. They come from industry, from federal labs, from academia, and from nonprofits. It's a mixture of those people. And for both phase one and phase two, we have these panels. Um, of uh, experts from outside plus ad hoc reviewers. And then all applicants receive verbatim copies of their reviews. And that's important because, um, you know, as you'll recall, we have about a 15% success rate with phase one. So um, you can apply for phase one. If you don't make it the first round, you can apply the next year. Um, there's no limit on the number of times you can apply for a phase one award. And you can use that, those comments from the reviewers to, um, you know, to modify your proposal and to make it, um, you know, to, just to follow those guidelines that you get from the reviewers and make a, some changes to your proposal so that perhaps you'll have a better chance the following year. Um, so you can reapply um, and, for phase two, phase one, as I said, you can apply as many times as you like. Phase two, it's very important to know you can only apply once, but there's no pressure to apply that very first year. So this year, um, if, if you feel like you can't um, complete your, your proof of concept and apply for, get ready for phase two, you can wait until the following year for that. That's not a problem but you do want to make it your very best effort for phase two because there's only, <clears throat> you can only apply once, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so next I want to talk a little bit about, about cooperative research and development agreements or CRADAs. Um, and so these are, um, um, that it's an app, it's a, a cooperative agreement with a research laboratory, a USDA research laboratory that um, has interest in your project or maybe has been working in that topic area or that realm. And um, you can make, you can um, um, contact them and um, discuss the possibility of making an agreement to use their facilities and their equipment to help you with your research. It is a distinct advantage. So as you see here on the slide, if, if we have two proposals, a panel has two proposals that are pretty equal in merit, but one of them has a CRADA agreement, then that is, is gonna be the tipping point. So it is a, dis, a really distinct advantage to have a CRADA agreement. And Kathleen Cohn, she goes by Kathy, is the, um, Agricultural Research Services, she's the point of contact, and that is her email address there. So you can, if you think that's something that interests you or something you want to explore, I encourage you to go ahead and contact her and see if there is a lab that is um, working or might be interested in your project. The next few slides are gonna be talking about factors that can improve chances of award success. So, you know, having a high scientific um, merit plus, or technical and plus a commercial potential, those things have to be balanced. And I just wanna say here that that's part of the reason we added technical and business assistance or TABA um, was because a lot of people are science-based, a lot of these small companies the PD is um, a scientist. And so, um, you know, it's a little bit of recognition that you can't be equally good at everything. So having some commercialization assistance through the TABA is a distinct, you know, is an advantage to you. It doesn't make a difference in um, choosing which um, proposals are selected, but it, it does provide you with commercialization assistance. And um, we don't shy away at all from high risk, high reward. So if you have a, 
project that you feel like is pretty high risk and high re reward, we encourage you um, to go ahead and apply because we are looking for those. Having good consultants is important. Of course, a credit agreement is important. Showing that you can have some, you have some business expertise, you have access to that either on, you know, in within your company or through TABA um, is, a, is really an advantage. And then having strong letters of support from your phase three partners or the, at the, you know, the end users or in people who want to invest, investors in your company that believe in it enough, your innovation enough that they really want to put up some money. So having some of those letters of support um, is, is really quite important. So I encourage you to do that. And then demonstrating in your proposal that you really have thought out a clear understanding of the entry level into the market and also then how you're going to go ahead and sustain your innovation in the market. So um, this slide continues with some advice um, for phase one. Provide, um, if you can, in your proposal, if you can kind of provide a vision of where you want to be at the end of phase two, um, so that the reviewers get the big picture. You have the big picture in your head, but um, share that. Try to you know, provide at least maybe a paragraph about where you see this going. Um, and then, you know, focus your phase one research on those critical enabling factors and still the importance of your project with an alignment with USDA priorities. And that's all in the RFA. Um, provide a detailed experimental plan and please include proprietary information. We're very careful with that. And we really need it to be able to evaluate, you know, your proposals fairly. Um, provide instances you know, provide some insight into the commercial potential. Um, and that can be kind of part of your vision statement for the first bullet. And then show the connectivity with communities that you're intending to serve by including those letters of support we just talked about with end users, consumers, customers, investors, those types of people. Yeah, more advice for phase one. Um, so be sure you complete the following steps. I put this in here just because um, my understanding is every year, I know it happened last year, but um, even prior to that, when I wasn't here, I understand it happens every year that somebody doesn't get these registrations in and they miss the deadline because of it. Um, so you have to register with your, your small business with sbir.gov. And then um, you have to re repeat all, the, uh, complete all the steps to register on grants.gov. And so you obtain a Dun DUNS number, that's fairly straightforward. It's regist registering with SAM.gov that um, tends to hang people up, I guess. Um, it can take up to two weeks with an additional five weeks more to actually get the EIN number. Um, so that's really important. If you're planning on applying this year and you don't have your SAM.gov number yet, then please go ahead and do that right, right after this presentation. Please go ahead and get that settled. Um, and then once you have that, then you create the grants.gov um, account. Um, so you can contact the topic area leader uh, for a co consult or a national program leader, I should change that in the slide. So every topic area has a national program leader and you can contact that person for a consult. You can contact them any way you like. What I, my advice to you is to write a very informal, no more than two paragraph, one paragraph is even better summary of your project, an overview um, in, within the body of the email and, and send that asking for a consult time. That way it gives the national program leader a little bit of time to think about, um, you know, just to be oriented towards your project, to think about what your project is and, you know, perhaps be a little more prepared to give you advice. And then um, I can't, emphasize this enough, but please read the RFA. 
Um, now, I want to let you know if you downloaded the RFA, like the day it was po posted, or any time before the afternoon of Tuesday the 14th, there is an edited version. There is a new edited version. And that edited version is very clear because all the edits are in red font. And so if you go to S uh, USDA SBIR um, website and go to the phase one RFA, um, when you open it up, you'll see right at the top, it shows everything that was edited in red font. And then as you go throughout the document, it will. So please make sure you have um, the latest version. The edits involved, um, there was uh, an error made with the um, total budget amount. If you include TABA services, it was a $150 error. Um, now we'll go ahead and accept applications that uh, have that error. Um, but if you can correct it, that would be fantastic. And then there was um, there were there were just a few other slight edits, um, but that was probably the biggest thing. Um, so go ahead and um, I would say download it so you can make it searchable. I know you can search it online, but I think it's just easier if you download it and make it searchable. And when you have a question, just you know search for it in the RFA, and you'll get a, usually almost always get a really good answer that way. Um, and then make sure that your application responds to all the review criteria that is listed in the RFA. And this is important too. Um, please don't wait till the last minute to apply. We also have people that um, end up having technical problems or you know, have um, last week a squirrel chewed through my cable. And if I was applying, for an SBIR grant, I wouldn't have been able to do it that day. So um, things happen. So if you can make your own deadline of maybe the November 2nd instead of November 3rd, I really encourage you to do that. Because it happens every year that people have run into some kind of glitch or something like the deadline. Um, the next few slides are places where you can get assistance. And um, I know you're getting assistance um, from um, Illinois FAST program and um, FAST programs are a part of that. And I'm just going over some other slides that talk to about all the different places you can get assistance. The small business development centers, there, um, there's at least one in each state and there's 62 in total. And you can um, find assistance um, through this website that's listed at the bottom here. Uh, FAST programs, you know about that. You're connected with the FAST program. Um, this is the website, um, in case you have an acquaintance that needs it, where you can find assistance from a FAST program in your area. And there are SBA growth accelerators. Um, and there's this website on the SBIR um, dot gov site. There's a web page on the SDR, SBIR's uh, uh, dot gov website that show where you can go and look at all these resources for local assistance. You just put in your state and it'll populate with all the different um, programs that will assist you with the application process. Now I just want to take a couple of minutes and talk a little bit about some of um, the SBIR success stories that we've had. Um, Alteros Buoyant Airborne Turbine, or BAT, it, what it does is it raises up high into the higher altitudes where um, there are really strong winds and they're consistent winds. And so it is um, really, it's, it raises way above the traditional turbines. So it can provide economic power for rural communities and remote locations. And they've had a lot of commercialization success. They've been featured on CNN and in the New York Times. Telecom group SoftBank has invested 7 mil million in Alteros Energies um, and for future deployment of the BAT technology in Japan. And then we have Prairie Aquatech. 
And it's a natural process to convert soybean meal to fish feed using microbial enhancement. It's called Mepro. And they've had quite a lot of commercialization success, including the 2019 recipient of the Aquafeed Innovation Award in Cologne, Germany. And they commissioned a 30,000 square foot facility in the summer of 2019 so they could scale up their production. And they've sold samples of through uh, many countries, and they're hopefully having new products coming to market this year. Embrex, Embrex developed a higher throughput and superior technology for OVO vaccination. The techni technology provided benefits to enhance efficiency and bird performance. They had a great deal of success. In 2001, they had 44 million in revenues and their employees increased from less than 10 to over 200, and they were purchased by Pfizer. And then more recently, um, we had a success story from uh, Sunsight Wind um, in Lawrenceville, uh, Georgia. The founder is Dr. Devin McIntosh, and they manufacture um, advanced small wind turbines that successfully compete with ro rooftop solar, even in moderate wind areas. So um, that's a really exciting innovation. And it's from a socially and ec economically disadvantaged applicant. And these, uh, this is a list of the SBIR awards that they've won starting back in uh, 2002, going through 2014. Again, I'm Melinda Kaufman, and I apologize for not being able to connect earlier and keeping you waiting. Um, but please contact me if you have specific questions that don't get answered um, in this hour. And um, that's, you can either contact me, at, that's my email address, melinda.cockman at usda.gov, or we have a general mailbox, sbir at, at usda.gov. And please visit our website, um, which if you just Google USDA SBIR, it'll come up and uh, spend some time looking through it. It has a lot of answers to questions. So thank you very much, I appreciate it. Thank you so much for that great presentation. Um, and again, I apologize for whatever the problem was with the link for you not being able to join right away, but I'm sure that um, Linda would be happy to answer some questions if anybody has questions they'd like to ask. Um, you can either put them in the chat or come off mute and ask them of her. I have a question, if you don't mind. Uh, thanks, Melinda, for your presentation. Uh, if I understand right, we, we can have, uh, we can involve universe in, in a SVIR, right? So we can have a, I don't know if it is it's called a subcontract or something. Yes, can we yes. pay? Can we pay indirect costs to uh, a universe collaborator, or is a, a universe going to charge indirect costs? In the in the SBIR, is it is it allowed for indirect costs in the SBIR? Yes, um, there are a couple of ways. So your question is, there was a little bit of cutting out. Your yeah, question so is, let's let's say my company. Well, the SBIR uh, grant has uh, a component to be developed at the university. So. Can we pay indirect costs to the university if they charge any? That you can have a, a ten percent de minimis um, indirect cost. You can do that, or you can um, develop a, a NICRA um, and uh, agreement. If you there's a really good web page on this, and if you mm -hmm. um, Google indirect costs. Um, SBIR or NIFA, the National Institute of Food and Agriculture, um, that indirect cost page will come up mm -hmm. and um, you can negotiate um, a, an agreement or you can take the flat 10% de minimis rate. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, yeah, you can certainly work with university scientists. That's really encouraged also in their so for phase one, um, they're limited to one third of the award. Mm -hmm. 
maybe, for phase two, it's one but, half. Maybe so, a clarification there, Shelly, yeah. I had in the chat of if you're going to sub award to a university to do the work, the university likely will have its own ICR rate as part of that a sub award, which is different than yeah. the 10% rate you just described. Correct. Yes. That's what I was just going to say. Yes. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Are there other questions? Hey, Melinda. Um, great talk as always. So regarding reaching out to Kathleen, um, getting a CRADA, I mean, I've done some research and I think like Sendemus uh, could be an interesting lab to work with because they're all about standardizing fire equipment and operator safety. Uh, mm -hmm. When I reach out to her, I mean, how, how in depth should I go? Just, hey, here's what we're working on. Here's the lab that I think could be of interest. Here's the cyber topic we want to go after. Yeah. Anything else you think she'd need? I would I suggest that you do the same thing I I um, recommended with the MPLs and just write you know an informal don't spend a lot of time on it overview of your project and um, you know what you're looking for in a credit agreement and then Ooh. send that to her make it really short um, as short as you can um, and send it to her and request an appointment. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Sure. One more question, Melinda. Uh, can we skip phase one or phase two is only for those that went through phase one? You are absolutely right. Um, you, you can, there's no direct to phase two. Well, if there are no others, we would like to thank our speaker again. Thank you very much for a great presentation. Thank you. And thank you for all sticking around and moving to a different link amidst our technical difficulties, but um, we very much enjoyed your presentation. Uh, again, I put in the chat if anybody would like one on one uh, technical support from uh, the FAST Center, I put the link in there for you to fill out the form and we would be happy to contact you and help you out with your proposal. Thank you all for attending.